Welcome everybody. Today we're going to talk about five principles for creating accessible Canvas pages. In order to demonstrate these five principles, I actually created a Canvas page for us that we can review. I adhere to some of the principles that I'm going to teach you, but there are also some things on this page that we're going to have to correct, and so we can work through that together. First of all, let's talk about what is accessibility. When I talk about accessibility and education, what I'm referring to is providing all of our students the same opportunity to access the information that we're providing in our Canvas courses. And so we might have to accommodate students who need visual accommodations, such as people who are blind or who have color blindness or low vision, as well as students who have hearing or motor or cognitive impairments limitations which affect how they access the content that we're providing in Canvas. Essentially, we want all of our students to have the same opportunities when they take our classes. So let's dive in. The first principle that we're going to talk about is the use of headings. And this is the same in Canvas as well as if you're creating a Word document or even a PowerPoint presentation. You want to use headings. And what that means is that if you want to distinguish your content in sections, sometimes you might be tempted to highlight some words and maybe bold them and make them larger. You want them to really stand out, for example, and you might even change the color of the words, maybe to you know just really help it to stand out. But this is just a paragraph. This is just normal text. And in terms of a screen reader, a screen reader is a device that helps students with low vision to be able to access the content. This text right here, even though it looks different, in terms of the formatting, it's the same in terms of web development properties as a regular paragraph. And so if you really want to um, distinguish your text for sections, then you need to use the headings. And in the Rich Content Editor, we have access to headings 2, 3, and 4. Now if I back out of here a moment, then you might ask, why is there no heading 1? There is a heading 1, and heading 1 is the title of the page, whatever you call it or it's the title of the quiz or the announcement or the discussion board. On a web page, there can really only be one H1 tag, a heading one, and so that belongs to whatever the page is called. And so we have access to headings two, three, and four, and really five and six. In the Rich Content Editor, you have access to headings two, three, four. If you go into the HTML editor and switch your view over there, you can change it to heading five, you can change it to heading six, even heading seven. I've never actually used heading seven, and very rarely would I even use a heading six, really. And there's a principle with headings that, in reality, you want to nest the headings. And so if I have a heading two right here, and I want a subheading within this section, then I would use a heading three. I wouldn't jump to heading four. I would first use a three and then a four. And so it nests that way. And I wouldn't start my page using a heading 4 if I haven't used a heading 2 or a heading 3 beforehand. Now I'll mention that perhaps you like the look and feel of heading 4 and you would like to use that and you haven't used the heading 2 yet. Still stick with heading 2, but if you want to get sophisticated like that, you can change the properties afterwards. You can bold it, you can italicize it and change the things, but you still want it to be heading 2 and you can just format it heading to. And if you want to get even more sophisticated, you can go into the HTML and you can write out some code. So I'll write some style here. So let's maybe be creative and change the color to red and the font size. Let's make that a crazy 60. So it's going to be really large. And let's take the craziest step further and let's add some text decoration and make it overlined. This is something you pretty much never see, but just for the sake of us exploring the options, um, I'll put that in there. And so there you can see, this is a crazy, crazy, it has an overline, it's red, it's really big, but you notice that it's still a heading too. And so that's what's important. The important thing isn't what it looks like. The important thing is that you're using the headings, using the paragraph tab in order to organize your content and that you're not just making the content bold and increasing the font size and saying this is a section heading. So principle one, it might not seem important, but this is extremely important in terms of screen readers and the way that they can read and organize the content. Quick reset here, and we'll move on to principle two. Principle two is the concept of using alternative text for your images. If I click on this image right here, this is a banner. I'm gonna click image options, and you can see that I put it as decorative. 
And this is important to either put alt text with your images or mark it as decorative because again for screen readers they're going to interpret the content of the page if there's some important content in the visual element on the page then they need to be able to interpret that and collect the data so they can pass it along to the student so in this case the image that i have up at the top of the screen it's decorative because it's a banner there's not really any content that is essential it's just supplementary and it just makes my page look nice However, if that was really important, then I can uncheck decorative. Um, the alt text is the file name. I want to delete that because you should never use the file name. That's um, bad practice. But for alt text, I might put something such as visual representation of various accessibility accommodations. Now, what you don't want to do is say, this is a picture of whatever it is and describe that because the screen reader already knows that this is a picture. And so it's describing what the picture is. You could use two or three sentences if you want. You don't need to write a tome or be incredibly descriptive and narrate every single pixel and element of the image, but you want to get the main points across so that a person with low vision or blindness would be able to get that information. And again, it's perfectly fine to use decorative text. There are plenty of images that I put in my courses that are purely ornamental. They enhance the aesthetic components of the course. They increase the visual appeal, but they're not fundamentally full of information that's important. So I just mark it as decorative. Principle three is regarding the use of tables for data and information, but not for layouts. And if you don't use it for layouts, then don't learn because it's just a better approach. But you can definitely use tables for information. Let's go ahead and build out our table here. So here's some information. It doesn't really matter what the content is in our example here. It's just the sorting this by columns and rows, putting information in there. And this is the purpose of a table. What you don't want to do is put icons in the table and organize the content, perhaps module one, two, three. You can do that with, with divs, and that's a different video that we can show you how to do that. But for tables, it's just information. It's just sortable content or categorized content, such as a list of students and their group information, for example, or a data table. So once you have a table that's used for data, uh, you don't stop there. You can also put a caption on the table if you want. So I would caption this one and save it. And then I have a spot up here for the caption. So if this is, for example, table three, and I don't know what the content would be, just something, you know, you can label the table. So that's a good practice. And I can also highlight the row. And if I click up on the table and click on the row properties, then I can assign that as a header. And so the screen reader is going to want to know what the header is. And so that's important. You can save that. You can write that in the code if you want to go into the HTML editor and if you're more comfortable doing it that way. But this rich content editor way is simple and pretty fast. Principle four is to use descriptive text for links. So what you don't want to do is let's say for more information, click here and put a big alphanumeric URL to that. Some URLs are even worse than that. You know, for example, sometimes I have to share links to Office 365 and I'll put that in there and it's a big, huge, long alphanumeric. Now, if I were to do that in a Canvas course, that would just be horrible. That would be torture for my students using a screen readers because what the screen reader would do is it would start reading for more information, click here, and it would read it out HTTPS colon slash slash TCS blah, 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 alphanumeric ampersand BDDE 3103-TDFS, whatever the, the thing, it would actually read every part of this. And that's not what you want. So what you could do is you could say for more information, refer to the course guide. And then what I would do is I would highlight this and either click on the hyperlink in the rich content editor, or I usually use the shortcut control and K, and then I can put the link down there and click done. And that's much cleaner. It's much better to look at. It's easier on the students and it's just a better way to do things. So this is called descriptive text. You're referring to the URL and it's hyperlinked right there without actually pasting the URL into the canvas page. So again, I used control K, let me remove this and let's do it the other way. I'm going to highlight this and we're going to put an external link and then I'll just paste that link in there and click done. Another thing you can do that some people don't realize is if I were to say refer to the announcements, I can actually grab the announcements from the navigation and I can drop it in the canvas course right there. Likewise, I can say go visit the discussions or the course files and it links it right there. 
if I'm referring to something that is actually part of the course, then I can go to, let's remove that link and let's just do a course link. And then it takes me to all my course pages. I can say, refer to this page, for example. So that is descriptive text for my links. And that's the proper way to share hyperlinks with your students. And again, what you don't want to do is in addition to just pasting the URL, you don't want to say click here, here, or read more. You want to actually describe where are they going and then hyperlink that description. Principle five is using the canvas accessibility checker. And so on any page that you're editing, anytime you see the rich content editor at the bottom, you'll see an accessibility icon. You can click on that icon and it'll bring you up to the accessibility checker. And so I have some issues right here. So I have an image that doesn't have alt text. And so I can say, let me change that. I'll put that as a handicapped parking spot. I'll go ahead and apply that. Now you see, I still have five issues. I have another issue. Let me close that down. In this case, I'm just going to put it as decorative just for the sake of our example, that some of these indeed are decorative, I could say. So it looks like, oops, here's a table that has no headers. And so let's set a header row and, or maybe a header row and a header column. All right. So now I'll apply that and move on to the next thing. And it says, okay, here's a GIF and this one, I don't want to mark it as decorative. I actually do want to mark that as, as alt text. And I'll go ahead and apply that. I can see there's just two more issues here. I will resolve that and click apply. And when we've resolved everything, then we get some celebratory elements saying that there are no accessibility issues detected. And so we can rejoice and say, yay. And so that was the fifth principle for creating accessible documents. I want to demonstrate one bonus principle for accessibility. And that would be video captions. If you're using a multimedia platform such as Kaltura or even YouTube, then there's captioning functionality built into that. If you happen to subscribe to Canvas Studio, then they also have a native captioning element that's automated. And so it's a good practice if you're ever doing any kind of video, whether it's a webcam video, a screencast, or anything else, then you always want to make sure that if there's a spoken element to it, then that video is captioned. And that's even if you don't have students who require captioning for accessibility or, or accommodation purposes, it's just a good practice. And so these were our five principles plus our bonus principle. And I don't want to imply that this is a comprehensive list. This is just getting us started. These are the first steps of creating accessible content in Canvas. And if you're not doing one of these principles, then you should really look into making that part of your course development process. And if you are incorporating all five of these principles, plus captioning your videos, then you're in a good position, but you can always look for what more can I do to enhance my course in terms of accessibility. If you like this content, I would really appreciate it if you subscribed. And I also wrote a pretty detailed blog post that covers all of these principles as well. So you can visit our channel, howtocanvas.com to access that and visit us on social media. You all are amazing. You're doing amazing things in Canvas. You're doing amazing things in the classroom and I want you to keep it up. And I want to wish to you happy teaching and learning.